The Royal National Lifeboat Institution is a charity that saves those at sea. Around 95% of their staff are volunteers. The RNLI currently has 236 stations operating nationwide and has saved the lives of over 140,000 people, averaging 22 saves a day. The volunteers, who come from all backgrounds, abilities and ages, share the responsibility of being the last hope for survival. They are ordinary people who do extraordinary things. I've always been interested in the lifeboat. There you won't find many young people that do it. Not many at all. It's hard, it's hard, really. We're, we're all mentally prepared. That's why there's only that select few that are lifeboat crew. We've got some of the guys on the crew who've done 25 plus years, just experienced things which ordinarily you know you wouldn't wouldn't get the opportunity to do. It's the same with most things in life, you know, you get out what you put in. So it's a worthwhile thing to do. I just feel privileged to be part of the organisation. Give your life to save someone else. I think that's what drives us. It just makes you feel, you know proud to, to be doing this. It's just superb. It's brilliant. I don't know what else to say. You're there to provide a service 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I suppose we're all adrenaline junkies at the end of the day. Training is held at their local station and also the RNLI College based in Poole which was opened in 2004 by the charity's patron, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. The college includes a facility known as the Sea Survival Centre, in which real-life conditions and rescue operations are simulated to give lifeboat volunteers essential, practical experience in sea safety and survival techniques. The Sea Survival Pool is used for crews to practice their capsize training using bespoke training boats. Complete darkness, choppy conditions, thunder, lightning and helicopter recovery can all be simulated to very real effect. Each station uses different methods for in-house training. Hunt Stanton practice their call-outs on a regular basis as they aim to respond within seven minutes for all situations. Previous procedure would include volunteers participating as the victim waiting out at sea to be rescued. The RNLI are very welcoming and open to new crew regardless of their experience. They even accept those who are unable to swim. However, we found out it does take a certain type of character and inner strength, which becomes evident when listening to the heroes recall their tales. Dave Peppercorn, based at Hunt Stanton, has just completed his training as he recalls a call out from September that almost ended in tragedy. Brancaster Beach in Norfolk was noticeably quieter today and certainly a lot less dramatic after a major incident 24 hours earlier. We um, had a page as normal, came down to the boathouse. Um, the weather was fairly calm, um, so they decided to launch the hovercraft. And we had a report of um, persons in the water up at um, Brancaster at the entrance to the channel. So we made our way down there, and after we'd launched, it was decided that they should um, also launch the ILB, the lifeboat, because um, people in the water, there was enough tide in that there to, um, to have the boat as well. As soon as we got on scene, we could see there was um, two girls clinging to a boy. Just before we got there, they let go and started to drift down with the tide. It was pretty strong and that started to move in fairly quickly. As we, we went from having one casualty area essentially to two. Um, so basically the hovercraft then had to 
make a decision as to what we should do. The, um, the other crew member, Michael, he jumped straight off the, and went and swam to one little girl who was still clinging on to the boy. And then the hovercraft then followed the two girls which were starting to drift away. The younger girl, she was, um, she was still quite with it, so I managed to sort of hop in and I sat her down in the seat. She was quite um, distraught. <laughs> The older girl, I think she, you know, she was sort of suffering a bit. It took two of us to um, actually recover her and get her in and put her into the um, put her into the seat. And at this point, we um, turned the hovercraft round and then went back to pick up Michael, who had the the third girl. And, uh, we we pulled up alongside her, re recovered them, pulled them into the hovercraft and then uh, made sure they were, they were all okay, um, or as well as they could be, and pulled up onto the, onto the beach at Brancaster where um, we waited for the, for the air ambulance to come, which had been, which had been requested by the Coast Guard, um, just as a precautionary measure really, just to make sure that they, you know, the girls hadn't, hadn't been suffering from any, anything like hypothermia or whether they'd taken on board any water. You don't really think about the implications of what could or couldn't have happened. 40 seconds from the moment we get there to the moment all the girls are actually on the hovercraft, so it's, it's over and done within the, in the blink of an eye. Well, the Coast Guard managed to sort the casualties out and we headed back. Even though I haven't been doing it as long as the other guys on the, on the hovercraft, you, you kind of follow their lead. Quite a good camaraderie to do it, being part of a team. It's quite an adrenaline rush to hear the page you go off. As one of the youngest volunteers to join the RNLI, he was only 17, Jonathan, now 20, talks about one of his more memorable experiences this summer at Clacton-on-Sea. Just after lunchtime, I think it was, the pages went off. It said launch both boats. And you know when it says launch both boats that it's something big. And the person got off the phone and said, we've got a capsized speedboat, multiple persons in the water. So immediately it's like, Right, person's in the water. Go, go, go. Team's Coast Guard and Patton RB, we have launched on service with two crew members on board, over. Coast Guard, Coast Guard Roger, we have been advised that there are four, perhaps five or six persons in the water, over. You just get that sense of urgency. Um, you can tell in, in the Coast Guard's voice. Um, and all we were greeted to was the nose of the boat sticking out of the water. I and mean, they were all just clinging to the side of that boat. Are you all okay? Yeah. We plucked two from the water on the Atlantic. I was worried about the other two. Um, one was in the water with, when the D-class approached him, he said, I've got a, I think I've got a broken shoulder. Um, and then the other one had a couple of illnesses. The guy with the broken shoulder um, also had a broken leg as well. Um, when the boat went over, the outboard engine come off, caught him as such, um, which obviously broke his limbs, so he was a bit worse for wear. And as we proceeded back, one of the guys in the D-class um, fell unconscious on us. Um, the eye, his eyes just rolled back in his head and that was that. Are you all right? Two people sitting there talking to you, and then one just like that just falls back. It's, it's quite a shock. He transferred him onto the Atlantic where we looked after him. Um, and we all headed back to Martello Bay. We're going to put you on the faster boat and get you back, all right, mate? We had an air ambulance helicopter on the way to us and also the Sea King rescue helicopter. But the Sea King come and landed on the beach. We take them down in the boat, pulled up alongside it and just hit the helicopter and they were straight off to hospital. You know, you come back after saving a life at sea and you feel proud, don't you? It's not all about the money, is it? This year saw one of Europe's biggest storms, St Jude, sweep across the country, and whilst damage was mainly reported inland, the storm also caused significant damage to those along the coast. The biggest tragedy was seen by those in New Haven, who suffered the loss of Dylan Alkins, who went missing amongst the waves and sadly was never found. 
We went to speak to second coxswain Lee Bracknell in New Haven about the aftermath of St Jude's and why he continues to volunteer. The autumn storm, or St Jude's storm I think it got nicknamed, was pretty ferocious down here at New Haven. Um, we had a flood tide, the sea was well, extremely rough. It's the roughest I've ever seen it. The wind speeds, we had a constant 50 knots of wind gusting 60, 70. When the pages went off, being um, you know, in, in the midst of that storm, you know you're going to something pretty serious. And we, we never know what we're going to. For our local area, we, we can go and assist um, the Coast Guard with, with body recoveries of suicides and, and things like that. We, we just don't know when the pager goes off. So to find out that someone was in the water on that particular day, um, the adrenaline just started to, to rush through the body. And the boat was out for five hours. We, we, we'd done a crew change after about an hour and a half. That's when we lost the light. Um, we had one crew member who was feeling pretty seasick and another one had, uh, had injured himself. And we went back out to commence the search down the other side of one of our, our harbour piers here uh, before being tasked back around to where the, the child had actually gone into the water um, and obviously by that time the tide had dropped, the waves had increased, the helicopter, the Coast Guard rescue helicopter was on scene, um, there was fire, fire service, police, ambulance, Coast Guard, everybody, even local, well most of New Haven were on the beach trying to find, find uh, the kids so uh, yeah it was, it was a very hectic day for that particular service where where poor old Dylan has been lost um, yeah it, it's still pretty raw I would say and we're always looking out you know when we're on the river looking out for him just to for closure for the, the family really I actually met his mum and that was pretty tough um, you know to say that we've done our best and just having to look into her eyes and, and say that, that it was, it was really tough. Because we, everyone's done their best, but yeah, I've, I've never really been in that position where we get to meet um, you know, some, the relatives of someone who's passed away on when we've been trying to find them. We're putting our life on the line to find this, this kid, which unfortunately, we, you know, he's, he's been lost to the sea. Her Majesty also found the time to speak to the lifeboat crew who searched for missing teenager Dylan Alkins when he was swept out to sea during the storm on Sunday night. The, the crowds on the quayside all turned and everyone was cheering and, and waving at us and it just made you feel, you know, proud to, to be doing this. And I think they realised that obviously we're all volunteers. It was just incredible, incredible feeling. My wife, she... She's come to terms with the fact that I can be called out day and night, you know, any time really. Sometimes it can be, can be annoying when the pager goes off, especially if you've got friends around. You know, the wife's just cooked a nice meal or something and next thing the page is gone. She looks at you and you, you say, I've got to go. She's like, see you later. So. From a family point of view, you know, I've got no, no kids or dependents or anything like that. So yeah, I can drop of a hat, I'm, I'm here. Because every time I seem to have people around, seem to get called to called to leave. Um, it's always the way for some reason. Another shout! Right. Do, 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 do. 